Just downriver, as I walk the shores of the Columbia, is one of the world's largest fully integrated zinc and lead smelting and refining mines, while also producing various precious metals, minerals, and even fertilizers. Everything we manufacture today incorporates something that comes out of the earth. And much of that extraction barely scratches the surface, literally. The deepest humans have ever gone is just seven kilometers or 4.3 miles down. The entire crust where all life resides is equivalent to the skin of an apple when compared to the mantle and core. But what if we can effectively access to produce every diesel, every gas, every hybrid and electric truck, in fact, every single thing that we make today that requires minerals and metals is about to benefit from reducing or eliminating fossil fuels from the mining extraction process itself. What if the world's most successful mines could save hundreds of millions of dollars in operating costs and be able to mine deeper and cheaper than ever before, all because of electric vehicles. Well, that's exactly what's happening. And we're gonna dig deep into the core of the matter and get totally trucked up. As part of my trucked up stops in Ontario, we're visiting Sudbury, home to another of the largest integrated mines on the planet. Valet Mines, as well as Glencore and others, were some of the largest deposits at deep levels of nickel, copper, gold, palladium, and platinum group are accessible, all because of a colossal impact tens of millions of years ago. But as mines go deeper, the heat and humidity increases, and the challenges to safety and viability rise exponentially. We're stopping in at an important new project at Cambrian College in Sudbury, Ontario, where some of these challenges are being addressed at the newly opened Electric Vehicle Lab. I'm here at Cambrian College with the Director of Research and Innovation here, and it is an amazing new program that launched, and it's kind of a surprise. A lot of people would not look at this as a place where EVs might really take off, but there's an exciting story to tell here. I'm here with Mike Camito, and he is the director, and we're gonna chat a little bit about what he's up to, and holy smokes, is he up to a lot. Mike, welcome to Trucked Up EVs. It's Thanks for having me. So give me an idea of number one, what are we dealing with here with this new lab? Yeah, so this is a brand new facility on campus. Uh, we had the official grand opening for the Valley Electric Vehicle Lab uh, just in early September. Okay. So it's an exciting time. We've been building this project out for the past couple of years. We had identified a trend in, in mining specifically that a lot of mines are making you know, ambitious targets to go electric and to electrify their fleets. And there's several reasons why they're doing this. One is that to get at deposits that are further down and had previously been inaccessible, you need non-internal combustion engine vehicles to do that to reduce the ventilation costs of getting that deep. Right now with the demand for critical minerals to feed the EVs that are, that are in demand, we need to go deeper than we've ever been before. And so to do that, we actually need EVs. And so that's gonna help the mines reduce their operating costs, but certainly for the workers that are working in those spaces, yeah. not having diesel particulates in so much abundance is gonna be a great health and safety alleviation. Mm -hmm. And so we recognize that this was coming. Uh, obviously the industry is still in the process of electrifying. We see a lot of mines across the country in Northern Ontario that are getting to the point where they'll be fully electric, but there's a lot of mines that either don't have the, the need because their life cycle is not long enough to adopt electric, but we're seeing that it's, it's becoming more prevalent in the mining industry. And so our goal was to develop this facility. We've had a lot of support from all levels of government, as well as industry partners uh, that have come in to help support the development of the lab so that we can help the companies that are making these EVs like Sandvik, for example, or local companies like McLean Engineering, uh, to help them prove out the specs they're getting so that they know that this is how this vehicle will perform. And they'll come to us because we have battery testing and electric motor testing equipment that could simulate what these vehicles would perform. Well, experience in the real exactly. world. Exactly, and then wow. from there, okay. we'll be able to give those insights to the valets, the Glencores of the world, so that they can better you know, identify which vehicles and which uh, uh, equipment platforms would be relevant 
for the particular duty cycles in different parts of the mine in different locations. So are you actually working on the development of the structures of the batteries for these vehicles through this process? Like, are you feeding into that? So not, not directly, but by testing the batteries on our battery emulation equipment, we'll be actually able to simulate a full load and draw on that battery, right. which will then inform what the OEM, the original equipment manufacturer, will do when they need to maybe tweak something to maybe provide more power to the traction motors, provide power to other parts of the vehicle. So we'll be working with them directly on helping them to optimize uh, the battery system and the vehicle platform. I can just imagine how, how much of a big deal this is because we're not talking, you know, a little depth. Yeah. We're talking what kind of numbers here? Well, I mean, we, we have a podcast here at Cambrian College and we did ours uh, 2 k underground at Snow Lab, which is part of Valet's Creighton Mine. Two kilometers underground. Yeah. yeah. And so we got off at the same stop as some of the other production workers. And so we're, we're talking, you're, you're deep underground. This is not... Uh, like just a, like a little, a little cellar, right? A little pit. Yeah, exactly. I, I probably couldn't fathom the amount of money a company has to expend to yeah. get fresh air yes. down to those points, and then you're going down there with diesel, mm -hmm. or you're going down there with some you know, internal combustion device. You are putting people at serious risk if you can't get that out of there. Yeah. The yeah. World Health Organization still has diesel as one of the number one carcinogens. And, uh, yeah, you know, yeah, it's, it's not it's not a healthy thing to be breathing in in an enclosed space. No, so I mean that'll alleviate uh, their their most significant operational costs is, yeah. is the ventilation, yeah. but certainly for the health and safety of the workers, it's a great yeah. transition yeah. for them to. Again, diesel's not going away immediately, and there's always going to be some mines that will probably continue Absolutely. to have yep. internal combustion engine vehicles. But if we can get more of these underground. It makes for a... Uh, for, uh, Dependent on the use case. Exactly. As is always the case with EVs. But yeah. So what we're standing in front of right now, this is actually 100% electric vehicle. Yeah. yeah. So this is an EV. This is an EV. Actually, everything in the lab that you'll see today as you walk around is, is, is EV. Is an electric is vehicle. Electric, yeah. Already developed. Now, who developed this? So this was originally developed by Artisan. Uh, they've been, since since the development of this, they've been acquired by Sandvik. So this is a Sandvik vehicle. And Sandvik is a European company? Isn't it? Yeah, they're based out of Sweden. Yeah, they make Sweden, uh, right. underground uh, mining equipment as well as drill bits and all sorts of other equipment. Right. Uh, but they were a supporter of the EV lab here at Cambrian. So they contributed cash to the development of the lab, but also donated this piece of equipment, which is a unique asset for, for anybody to have, especially yeah. at college. So for us to have like a fully electric a uh, piece of equipment that you'd see in an underground operation is, is huge for us. It'll be beneficial for us to calibrate the equipment so that we can always ensure that the reading that we're getting off of the machines that we have here is is reliable. Right. Uh, but the other interesting thing for us is part of what we do here at Camry and R&D is that companies can utilize this vehicle as part of a project that they want to do. So if you were looking to test a piece of equipment, whether it's collision avoidance technology, you wouldn't be able to go to Valley or Glencore and ask to borrow a production scoop for half a day. Those, those equipment is tied up. It's in, working. It's working, it's making money, That's right? right? But you can come to Cambrian College and we've done projects with companies that are looking to integrate new technology as a way to validate whether or not this would be something that the mines would wanna buy. So we've actually been working with a company out of Kitchener Waterloo, Lupex, uh, okay. and they actually got their start in autonomous food delivery. They've pivoted into mining with collision avoidance. And so they've been working with us using our our Sandvik early on, and now they're working with a different electric vehicle platform we have. Wow. And the results and the data they get from here will help them get to a point where they can then sell to the companies that would be adopting onto their fleet of vehicles. So you're looking at all the different types of stresses as well, what these vehicles are gonna uh, be subject to in those environments um, and regarding heat and everything else to do with the battery packs? So not yet, we will be eventually. So what we don't have right now immediately in the, in the near in short term is a climactic chain chamber to simulate the type of environment that you get underground because Heat. that is a real consideration. Yeah. It's high humidity, high temperature. Yes. So eventually we will get to that point where we'd want to put the vehicles and the batteries and the motors through the types of conditions that you get underground. Right. Uh, but for now, just with safety considerations, we're not going to even be testing batteries in the building. We're going to be building a battery containment system outside. Yeah, for that good reason. Yeah, then the system will be tied in to our emulators through through that containment system. So that okay. if we were ever in an event where we had a thermal runaway, that's happening outside contain. of the building. Uh, it, it's obviously still not an ideal situation, but we'd rather have it outside 
have the structure, the containment structure go up versus like this brand new yes. lab that uh, we, we just opened. So with all of this, this must be a, an unbelievable opportunity for students. It just isn't available anywhere else. No, no. Again, to have a lab like this that's focusing on underground equipment is, is unique in Canada. And so for us, like this is a great way for students that are graduating from programs that will go work in mining to get hands-on experiences with electric vehicles right now. So students from the heavy duty technician program, industrial millwrights, electrician mm. or electrical engineering technology program, like for them to be able to come in here and actually work on a real life electric vehicle to help us rebuild a formerly uh, diesel uh, powered vehicle to make it battery electric. Like these are some, you can't buy these types of experience no. learning opportunities, right? And so right. for them to get that hands-on learning, working with real industry partners, working on applications that will benefit the mining industry, like that's, that's great. Cause it goes over and above what they're learning in the classroom. So when they graduate, those are the students you want to hire and bring them into operation. Yeah, I know it's an interesting time right now because again, it's not the case for everyone, but you can, you're in a situation where you could have a, a production miner driving to work in his or her electric vehicle. They go underground operating electric vehicle to get the critical minerals that we're using to power, power the electric, electric vehicles, vehicles on surface. So it's, it's an exciting time. Certainly, I think the call just come at it at, at an opportune moment. The industry certainly hasn't solved everything yet. Mm -hmm. And as you know, like technology and battery chemistries are changing oh. you know, weekly, daily. So, I mean, we're at the point now where this equipment in this lab, I think is still, there's a lot of life ahead of us. I think it yes. will evolve over time, but, uh, but by no means are we trying to come in, you know, five years too late and say, hey, look at this lab. And somebody would have needed that five years ago. They need it right now. Just a side note, here in Sudbury, it's like a, an amazing part of the world. Why is there so much nickel and copper uh, down in the ground around here for these to go get? I heard that it was a massive asteroid strike and this is the molten goo that bubbled up and then yeah. formed and brought all those rich minerals to the surface or near the surface. Well, I mean, Sudbury is, uh, it's, it's known as like the, it's a crater, right? Essentially. So yeah, it's a crater. when that meteorite or asteroid collided with the earth and it just punches all of those minerals into the ground. You're right. That's basically what's been supplying the basin, you know, for the last hundred plus years. There's even a, a lake not far from here, Wanapate Lake. It's one of the deepest lakes, uh, I think freshwater lake in Canada, but that's that's also an, another example of a meteorite strike. Is, yeah, so you see that all over the landscape, right? I mean, yeah. I think the city's done a, a great job at re-greening. Yeah. Uh, and again, you know, part of that is, is from the, the geological formation of that asteroid, but obviously the mining industry prior to the 1970s it was not necessarily very environmentally friendly. Right, right. Uh, and that's changed. And that's changed quite a bit as well. You can see it as I drive around. Yeah. You can really see the difference. So it's, and it's, smell the difference and all those other things. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's a, it's Sudbury's a vibrant city that's very green right now. We still have nine operating mines, two more that are coming online in the next couple of years. Yes. But again, you wouldn't know that just by driving through. You, right? you can see some of the industrial mm -hmm. landscape on the horizon, but for the most part, over the last 50 years. Profound uh, changes. Yes. Hey, well, let's go take a walk sure. around and check stuff out. Yeah. All right, Mike, so what the heck are we looking at here? It looks like some kind of mainframe from a CIA headquarters. <laughs> yeah, so this is this is our battery emulation system. So okay. between these six cabinets, we have 600 kilowatt capacity of testing. And right. so this is where we're gonna be doing uh, battery simulation and, and, and drawing load from batteries. And so we'll either be working with you know, we can hook up an electric vehicle with the with the battery as part of it, or we can just test uh, standalone batteries, which we'd be doing in our containment system that's gonna be coming online soon. Uh, so in addition to being able to test batteries, we can also do different test work in here. And so we're actually working with a company right now to do a test work on, on a prototype for a charging unit. And so oh, the great thing about these cyclers is that it's not just limited to batteries. We can test microgrids, we can test chargers, anything anything electric we can test. Obviously our, our, our bread and butter is gonna be with, with the vehicles in the mining industry, but there's a lot of applicability with having these units here. So so, so tell me a little bit about what exactly are they doing? They're, they're forcing the batteries to run through their cycle? Yes, exactly. Okay. And so then from there, the power that we're discharging from the batteries eventually will be put into a containment system that we could then ideally feed back to our grid, or at least okay. put into a battery bank on campus that can then be discharged at, at peak time. So ideally we're in a, we're in a, a state and you know, once we get up and running where the electric vehicle batteries that we're testing will then be used to help reduce our overall oh, you know, that's operational brilliant. costs, right? So, so you create a little bit of a loop. Yeah, exactly. That's that's the goal if we're, if we're at the capacity where we're able to harness enough power. That's a lot of battery 
uh, capacity. Yes. What's yeah. over in the Sandvik? Do you know what that thing is? And I get asked this question a lot, and I never have the appropriate <laughs> answer. <laughs> That's but, okay. <laughs> uh, but I mean, I think where we're, we're seeing right now in mining is that the size of the batteries we're getting up to like megawatt, right? Yes. That's and what so I was like presuming. what we what we have right now is going to allow us to to cover like a good size of the market. Uh, but as vehicles get bigger. Um, there will be a cap on what we can do. The nice thing about the system is that it is, uh, you can add to the, to the capacity of the system, right? So another cabinet would give us another 100 kilowatts, then we're up to 700. But for now, you this would certainly cover You just go cabinet by cabinet off. as you need to expand. Yeah, so right now, like that Sandvik is well under the 600 kilowatt mark, so we're good with that. Right. So we're good with, with equipment in that size. Obviously, if we get uh, much beyond that, uh, we'd be looking for upgrades. But for now, this gives us it a good It does the corner. job and you, it's, it's totally expandable for yeah, what you need. exactly. And then you can drive this thing through a cycle lifespan. Yeah. So you can, you can emulate it running 1,000 cycles or 2,000 yeah. cycles and 3,000 cycles and then you're checking your degradation, yeah. you're checking weak points, fail points yeah. in the system. Yeah, and then with additional, uh, with additional capacities that we can feed into this machine, you can simulate like ramp, like ramp elevation, different things like that okay. to, to really try to get... Which is going to be big in a mine. Yeah, exactly. And the mines are doing this with the digital twins they have, so ideally we'd be in a situation where as the equipment starts to really come online together, you'd be feeding this information into a digital twin so that you can mimic how it would be performing underground in that environment, right? Oh wow, that's, yeah. that's wonderful. Yeah. Let's go take a look at some of these sure. other toys. Yeah. So we've got a Manitou. Yes. Looks a little different than the Manitous I know. Yeah, so this was donated to us by Equipment North and okay. it was converted over to electric uh, by a company that was, I think, later uh, procured by... Procured by someone else? Right? Yeah. So. It was important for us that if we're going to have an electric vehicle lab, that if we're using lifting equipment in here, it should be non-combustion. And so we were fortunate that uh, Equipment North was willing to donate this. And right. so uh, it, it's been great. We use it. We use it a lot. And I think it's important to, for us to to not only talk the talk but walk the walk in here. And and question. Yeah. So this is a Frankenstein, is it? Yes. And what would be the what would be the use case for this vehicle? It's just basically like a, 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 a elaborate forklift? Yeah, exactly, right? So it's got a, an extendable boom, uh, but otherwise it's just a ruggedized forklift, right? So we use it for moving things around the lab. Eventually, when we're moving pieces of equipment, uh, you know, like as we're rebuilding vehicles or bringing in different types of, uh, of components, this will be a go-to for us. Again, quite, quite honestly, we never had a forklift before in our lab, so this has been a game changer for us just in terms of like moving things around when we need to uh, right. kind of change the shop to make it more modular. So That's fantastic. Yeah. And then the big white beast, what do we got over here? Yeah, so this was actually a, br a brand new addition to the lab. This was donated to us uh, by the Walden Group and one of the subsidiaries, JNS Manufacturing. And so uh, this is, a, it's kind of like the Sandvik LHD, it's a little bit smaller, uh, but this was actually a uh, diesel, diesel LHD with the ability to also plug in electric. Uh, so what we're doing with them now is now that they've donated the vehicle platform, we're going to work with them to build out a project scope where we're going to convert this to fully battery electric. All right, so it's currently possibly a diesel series hybrid. Yeah, exactly. Okay. So the drive, the, the drive, the electric drive that is associated with this is, is powered no longer, by a diesel generator yeah, originally. Yeah, but the, the drive doesn't work right now, so right now this vehicle is immobile. So it's, right. it's kind of stuck here for a little bit. Uh, but what's great about this project potentially is that you, we'd be looking to provide Walden with a roadmap where if they wanted to convert legacy equipment for their customers. You're going to help them get there. And help them get there as an option, right? They're currently not in the electric vehicle game yet, but there might be ways for them to explore that by doing these types of R&D projects and figuring out what the cost would be, you know, to take old equipment like this that was sold, you know, many years ago. It's still working out in, in, out in service, but maybe the customer's looking at, you know, is there something we can do to prolong the life by by swapping over. That's actually over. really exciting. So this is where the diesel generator was, I'm yeah, presuming. Yeah, and those are actually just banners, I think, that Walden left behind, so you can ignore those things on the side. Uh, okay. But yeah, this is basically the envelope, the envelope. we're going to have to work with. Right, so, so you've got to figure out where your uh, battery, this is, this, is, this is where it's at. Yeah. And you're, then you're going to have to deal with weight distribution yeah. over your wheelbase and all those lovely things. Yeah, yeah. so. It's a little bit of a, little bit of a uh, an engineering, conundrum. 
Yeah, we're fortunate that our, our lead mechanical engineer has an automotive background. Oh, excellent. So this is right in his wheelhouse. Right. And then we have some, uh, we have an electrical engineer as well that will support this work. We're actually hiring an EV engineer soon, hopefully, uh, and they'll be working directly in this lab and this will be a project that they'll be tasked with as well. So. This is so fantastic. Uh, I'm absolutely thrilled with what I'm seeing here. Oh yeah, we're, yeah. we're excited as well. Mike, I just want to thank you so much. Yeah. Like, you took the time out of your day to do all of this. This is breakthrough technology, if it develops, that's going to have a profound impact on the industrial sector. Thank you so much no, for- my pleasure. Thanks for Taking coming. the time to come out yeah. for it. Let me have trucked up EVs here in your, uh, in your lab. Absolutely. Thanks again, Anytime. Mike. Hey, if you really enjoyed this content and you want to see more of it, please click the like, subscribe, and bell notification icon down below. I'm getting close. This channel is just on the verge of hitting 3,000 subscribers, 5,000 is the goal because I'm hoping to make this channel viable, that it's not a losing proposition. I'm thinking around 5,000, I'm going to be close to break even on what I'm putting in and what I'm getting out. So any help that you can provide, any support you can provide, more importantly, keep right on watching and I'm so grateful for all the support. Once again, thanks for watching.